existing alone anymore. It's the recovery, it's the explanation of what this new stuff is. It's going to be much more extensive, much more expensive. We're, we have to do, we have to film all of it. That's going to be much more expensive now because it'll be longer. And then we have to create a documentary film of this to pay for the investment. Mm. So we've got a, you know, we've got a good deal set up. We're just now starting to put it out in front of people over here. So we're confident that the money will come. It's a few million dollars, but it'll be paid back easily enough. And uh, when, you know, once we have that underway, then he can have access to a 454 machine. And once he has that, instead of recovering this thing in bits and pieces, two and three and four and 500 base pairs long, he can recover, get this, a million base pairs at a run. Mm. Those 454 machines will recover a million base pairs at a run. And so what that means is he can have the whole genome, all 3 billion base pairs, within two months, hmm. literally, mm -hmm. within two months. So once he has that, then they've got to figure out what it all means because half of it is going to, well, not necessarily half of it, uh, you know, but a lot of it is going to be unknown stuff and they're going to have to figure out how it relates to to human and it's just it's just going to be a fascinating study just one of the great great events in scientific history is coming down the pipe here and the people who are listening to me now on your show and the other few shows that I've done and and who follow on my mailing list and and you know who who are the you're now the insiders you now have an inside track on everybody out there because until we step on the world stage to begin the process of forcing it down the throat of science they're not they're gonna just ignore it and pretend it isn't existing so right right they're in their last they're in their last few weeks of just blissful blissful ignorance about all this but you know it's it's the snowball is rolling really Hendrik I don't see how it it you know can be turned around now. We're we're very excited, mm. and we've just got to keep putting one foot in front of the other until we turn the corner. What whenever that is, and everybody will then know about it around the world. It'll be a really really big story. So, uh, what could or what would do you think some of the criticism be if we look at the 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 base pair uh, numbers again? I mean, how, how many have you been able to recover now, and what would be a, a robust answer then in, uh, for you in terms of the number of base pairs that that uh, your scientists can find for you? Well, he has to find. He would like to find just what he needs more than anything. Henrik is just repetition. He needs to find the same thing over and over again. See, that's what science is all about. One of the things that scientists respect the most about DNA is that it's the math of biology. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in, in math, you, you say 2 plus 2 equals 4. Well, okay, this time 2 plus 2 equals 4, but the next time, maybe not. So you do it again and you say, okay, 2 plus 2 equals 4. Well, okay, that, that's pretty impressive, twice in a row. You do 2 plus 2 equals 4 five or six times, it's pretty doggone hard to argue that the next time you do it, it's not going to be four. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So we have to. It, there has to be repetition. There has to be redundancy, so that nobody can say, "Oh, well, you just did it once." That doesn't mean that the next time it's not going to be something else. That you haven't made some kind of mistake. That you haven't misinterpreted it. So you have to show a sequence of testing such that the same the same equation is going together, the same parts go together, the same chemicals go together with the same batch of DNA and the same results come out and then it's fairly impressive and it's going to be pretty hard to argue with. But even then, even then, as the geneticist said, we can't even right now anticipate the arguments that the really smart ones among them are going to come up with. Mm -hmm. And they will come up with any kind of ridiculous thing you can imagine. And just because it might be possible that this thing could have happened, then that science is going to stand pat on that and say, okay, this is because it might be this crazy thing, 
this is enough for us to say we're, we're, we're going to put this on tentative and it, and it might not be true. Like, for example, when I, would di- when I would discover things in the physiology of the star child, let's just look at the bone, for example. Now, the bone of the star child is half as thick as it ought to be uniformly around the skull. It weighs half as much as it ought to weigh. It's two or three times as hard because it's not, com- it's not, chemically like human bone mm-hmm. it's chemically like tooth enamel and woven through the bone of the star child skull are fibers unknown fibers durable fibers that are not found in any other animal in the world that anybody knows about now that's four things for major colossal differences in the bone of the star child compared to human does that impress scientists no no you know why because they say well Nature can do anything. That's just a combination effect of differences of de- of deformities mutations, of quirks, of uh, random mutations. chance. Or, yeah. Exactly. So, if science's answer to everything physiological, everything that I came up with was nature can do anything. Mm. All right. The one place they can't apply that to is DNA because nature can't fool with DNA because it's math. It's the math of biology. And if we consistently produce uh, results that are not found in the NIH database, science, some scientists will say, well, just because it hasn't been found, every species on planet Earth has not yet been sequenced, so we're going to assume it's going to be found in one of those. Mm. And, and that will be some of their answer. But the reality of it is that if we, if we can show this, people are going to know the majority of people are going to know that this really is alien DNA. And as you, as you probably know, in poll after poll around the world, about 50% of people already believe in the reality of UFOs and aliens. So we've got a, a, a built-in audience there hoping for proof. And I think that we will be able to provide it with this to a level that the average person and even the average scientist is going to believe in. But now let's let's be clear on how science undergoes major profound change. Mm-hmm. Always, always, in every example that anybody can, can come up with, the the reigning bosses of science at the time, those who are in charge, those who are the leaders of the field, they will not accept the new thing. No. They can't afford to accept the new thing. They have to die out, literally, physically be planted in the ground before the new younger generation can come up, and those are going to be accustomed to it. Those are going to be able to wrap their their minds around it, and it for them it will just be a, a new reality that they have to deal with, and they have to find ways to incorporate into their worldview. So that's just the way it works. So there are going to be what they call the diehards. That's where the the term one of the areas that it's applied best. Mm. The diehard group of scientists are just never going to accept it. They can't afford to because it just it, it so profoundly distorts their own worldview. Yeah. But the new generation, they'll jump on it. Young kids coming out of grad school, young guys just get go, you know, young women, men and women getting going in their careers. Um, they will they will see it as okay, uh, we have to accept this and and what do we do with this? What how, how do we make use of this? How do we incorporate this into what we know? And the reason let, let's also understand that the reason science resists the idea of alien life and of hominoids for that matter. This is the reality of Bigfoot, Yeti and and all of those creatures that live around the world. The reason science resists both of those is simple. It's going to absolutely stop the idea of human evolution dead in its tracks. It's basically going to kill the idea of evolution, at least as it applies to humans. But if you take away human evolution, you're very quickly going to take away the idea of evolution of domesticated plants and animals. And before you know it, science is going to have to look to accepting the ideas of Zechariah Sitchin and myself in my book, Everything You Know Is Wrong, and, and other people who write about what the Sumerians wrote 5,000 years ago mm. about 
uh, gods with a small g, aliens coming to live on earth and deciding to create humans as their slaves and servants around 200,000 years ago. Now, this takes our conversation completely in another direction. So I only just want to mention that because that... Ex when